the next module is um, an example that we've recently worked out where we're putting some of these things to the test um, based, based on a, an attention shifting task. I've presented this on several <laughs> occasions before. Um, and there's probably a few uh, um, you know, extra videos of that on the internet. Uh, so I, I summarized this somewhat quickly here. We have an experimental task that was collected by Townsend et al. And it's 38 subjects um, who were recorded. And we recorded, or they recorded, 32 channels of EEG. And what happened here is the following. There, there was a stream of stimuli being presented to the person. And a fraction of these stimuli were designated as targets, 20%. And a fraction of them were designated as non-targets, 80%. The order was random. And there was something like 100 to 400 milliseconds between the onset. So it was rather fast. And, and what's so interesting is some of these stimuli were randomly presented in the auditory channel. So they came through speakers, you know, uh, beeps and boops, for example. And others were presented visually. So um, they came over the screen and were bright and dark rectangles. And this is just a background activity uh, in this experiment. And now what was interesting in this was that occasionally, the subject got an instruction to switch to another sensory modality and attend only to targets either in the auditory modality or in the visual modality. So these were switch cues. And they were the word look or the word hear presented in both modalities. So it was both over the speaker and on the screen. And so um, there were a bunch of other blocks that we were ignoring and so on. So what's interesting about this experiment is this. You have two cases there. Um, in, in one case, a person is attending to auditory stuff, and the other is attending to visual stuff. And there is no external clue uh, in what the subject is really doing, which tells you what they're, what they're attending to. So it's kind of an intrinsic process internal to the person. And it's something that might be interesting to pull out with a brain-computer interface, attention deployment. Um, that would be a stationary oscillate. Uh, sorry, this would be a steady state, short time process, basically. Either they're attending to this or that. What we did here is we didn't look at the steady state behavior, but we're looking at the activity relative to the switch cues themselves. So there you have time structure. What you have is a person is attending to something, and then he gets a switch cue, or she gets a switch cue, and then he or she is attending to the other modality. And there's two cases. Either you switch from vision to audition or audition to vision. So we are analyzing that data relative to the switch cues and see if we can predict in what direction they are switching at that queue. The reason why we're doing this uh, is to make use of all this time structure and see if we can learn um, these parameters you know, changing over time and in frequency and in space, basically to learn everything at the same time. So the goal is to build a classifier that can predict the direction of a person's attention switch relative to, um, to this queue, and um, to design it in such a way that we can interpret um, from a neuroscience pers perspective, what processes in, in the person's brain in a sense are relevant, and then to evaluate how well that actually works, of course. Uh, it, it's basically online capable. So what we're doing is a three-stage thing. We are first decomposing the signal, the, the raw. This would be, say, one trial. We take this one trial, multiple channels, multiple samples, and we decompose it using an independent component analysis into multiple components. And these are some actual components from the real data. So they look pretty good. You know, Here's a motor component. Here's a frontal, radial, central. This is probably an eye, lateral eye movement component, and so on. What we're using here is a multi-model amica. Uh, this is a technical detail, but it gives you sort of more components than you had sensors. So a chance goes up that we find what we're looking for. And then for each component time course in this trial, which might be five seconds, we are doing a, wave light, a, a continuous wavelet transform, which gives us in time and frequency basically you know, the power for this component. So for this component, we get these features. For that component, we get those features. So this is a time frequency representation for multiple spatially localized components. Uh, they are pretty noisy, as you see here. And also, it's many parameters. It's only order of 300,000 parameters per trial. And now we are trying to learn from that. We're trying to find which ones are relevant, how, you know, how they're weighted, positive, negative, and so on. And so we put a predictive model on top of these features. You can understand the BCI is kind of a pipeline, right? Again, you know, there's some 
spatial decomposition, spatial filtering, then there's some mole wavelet on epochs and so on. And then comes the prediction function, which goes on and does some statistical mapping. So to learn this, we have, again, this problem of having underdetermined solutions, you know, uh, so too many parameters, too few trials. And so we need to assume something to make it tractable statistically. What we assumed here is the model is going to be sparse in components. It uses only a few components. This is what I said before. If the components are independent, you can assume that only a few of them actually are relevant to your question. The other is um, it's time frequency. And we assume that our model is low rank in time and frequency. Like I explained before, we think I show you this in pictures. We also dropped in an anatomical prior. So we thought, we thought, well, it's a brain process, and it should probably come from the cortex as opposed to from muscles and things like that. So we uh, have that in there. And uh, here's a picture of uh, the weights that were assigned to one component. I call it here theta k. That's a low rank matrix. Um, it's actually the same one that I showed before. And that means uh, oops, you can interpret this as um, a, a loading in frequency, like a vector. Say it has a peak here and another peak here and a peak here, and some weighting over time. And so this is there's some latent process in here. It's time it, you know it's, has a particular characteristic frequency profile and it's weighted over time. And this is rank one, but you can easily learn well matrices that are the sum of multiple of these you know weights picking up different kinds of latent processes latent spectral processes. But since these are independent components, usually each component contains only one um, of these com um, processes. You can solve this as one big convex optimization problem, basically. You've already seen this part before. Uh, it's basically um, you know, just a logistic loss and some weight matrix or tensor. And the x here is now basically the features in, it's pretty much couple slides earlier, it's basically these features. That's what x is. OK, back here. And the only penalty that, uh, or the, the main penalty that we're using is um, the trace norm, or which is you know, the sum of singular values for, uh, for each of these components and the associated weight matrices. And we are summing this penalty over all components, basically, and the weights for, you know, the weights for each component. So um, in other words, we're basically pruning down how many components we're using. We're deriving them to 0 because we're penalizing you know, the sum over all components. And we're also deriving the number of latent processes that we're picking up per component and find only a small number of those. And so it becomes statistically tractable in some way. And then we just evaluate how well that works to see as a feasibility check and sanity check whether it makes sense. I show you how we did that. So that's a 10-fold um, cross-validation. So we have a whole recording with this entire task, 250 trials or so, splitting it up into the training and test part, train on the training part, test on the test part. We left five trials out here. And uh, it generates 10 folds. We use nested, we use parameter search to find the right trade-off parameter here, lambda which governs how many of these processes we pick up. And that, that search was done in a nested cross-validation. So it's you know, a cross-validation on the training set. You know, for each parameter setting, do a cross-validation, quantify how well it works, try the next parameter setting, keep the best one. And ICA in any statistic was only calculated respectively on the training set. That's important because if you do the ICA on the whole data, um, you are sort of, in a sense, statistically double dipping. <laughs> uh, you know, you're, you're quantifying how a classifier works that has already seen the test data. And that's a very well-known no-go. And it's very easy to make this mistake. So, but fundamentally, BCI lab, for example, only ever applies these kinds of things to the training set. And what we got is a mean accuracy of 86.4% correct across subjects, so at a chance of 50%. So that's actually highly significant. It's pretty neat. So if you think, what, is the, what direction is the person switching his or her attention uh, in, you get this question, uh, uh, you get the answer right 86% uh, of the time just from five seconds of EG, which is kind of nice. And here is a plot from one exemplar subject uh, of what the model looks like. So just to drive the point home, 
what you learned is a small number of components that were relevant, basically. Uh, the, you know, the component spatial filters and so on all came from the ICA. So in this case, it's um, 10 or so. And then for each component, we have the time frequency graph. And uh, they are low rank. What we see here is actually um, we do see some biologically plausible things in this model. So we see, for example, that these occipital components, like this one or this one, um, primarily weight uh, s things and as oscillations around 10 hertz highly. So that's 10 hertz occipital alpha idle oscillations. And that makes perfect sense because um, when a person is, that's informative about whether a person is attending to visual material or not, after all. So it's very clear. There's also a switch in weight from positive to negative weight around the time point zero where they get the cue. And that's because, of course, they switch, say, from visual to auditory in one class, or they switch the other way around in the other class. And so that's why there's this transition. And uh, what you also see is you know, the, the point where the switch happens is not actually at zero. It's sometime after zero, like here. It happens at one second after. And for this component, it's at 0.9. And this component is at 0.7. So the t latency of the switch is different. So you see a lot of stuff in this one solution, basically. You, there's other things going on, such as frontal theta bursts, also about right at the time of the you know, switch. Here's, here's another thing um, happening in some central location and so on. Uh, and there is not much more going on. You know, this is sort of almost a full story. So it says, you know, this is, the, this is the set that I learned with variable complexity of the model. So this is basically the most complex model that it, was f that it could fit on the data. So um, that's, we've, we've published this, this at ICON. Um, <laughs> we're actually currently uh, finishing up a paper, uh, journal paper on that one. So there's, there's a bunch of issues, of course, if you're running approaches like that, such as it may take a couple of hours to calculate. Also, um, again, you're not necessarily guaranteed to get what you want in the ICA, but you can work around that. And if you have artifacts, um, you can get problems if you're not having ways to deal with that. So in particular, ICA is somewhat sensitive. But there's also lots of artifact rejection techniques that, um, that are applicable there. And that's, that's the end of the outlook. Um, uh, there's a few more remarks that I make um, subsequently.